Jason Tim Hoops tonight. Welcome back to the show. Is your life uh, just one big instant reaction at this point? Yeah, b- pretty much. Yeah, it, it, it's crazy because we go usually during the day, most for the most part during the season, and then we shift towards going at night when we get into the postseason. But then inevitably what ends up happening is I wake up in the morning and I'm having my coffee and I start watching film and then I start wanting to record during the day too. And then we start going like, you know, nine or 10 times a week. And it just is, is crazy. But uh, at the same time, like I just told you when I got on the call, like it, it's like the NBA is so damn talented this time of year or or in general that this time of year is just so much fun because like every one of these series is super interesting. Like even Pelicans thunder, I, uh, I think that makes for six of the, of the eight first round series that are super, super interesting. Yeah. And like, man, I I just feel spoiled. (laughs) Yeah. No, it's a, it's a good time. Do you like have a set time when you're not going to be talking basketball, but then you end up talking basketball or watching basketball anyway? Yeah. It's, it it is where, uh, it's just become part of my routine. And I mean, part of this is like, I don't know, you feel the same way too, where basketball is just kind of our life. It's what we do, you know? So like, if I'm not, if I'm not talking about it, I'm playing it or I'm coaching it and it just kind of dominates everything. I actually have found little ways to get breaks from it through, uh, I, I used to listen to a lot of basketball podcasts and I've kind of stopped doing that. Mm. And now I like, I'll listen to like audio books and stuff like that to just try to find some breaks in the day, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's tough. Let, let, let's start here. And you, you talked about our playing experience. And as you know, I've had issues with the knee. And mm-hmm. everybody's talking about Joel, the way he's moving. The bigger concern for me is that his knee buckled twice already since the return from the outside looking in. And I've dealt with this. I, I've dealt with this before. When your knee starts buckling, it's almost like a crapshoot where whatever step you take, whenever you jump, there's a chance that your knee could buckle. And just watching it, like, I thought it would make sense for him to play in these playoff series, but with new information, kind of helps you make new opinions, right, in a lot of ways. And I just feel like watching his knee buckle twice, he's not moving right. I don't know, man. Like, I think he's done. I think his knee is done. So I can't speak to this because I've been very, very lucky with the knees. Now, I've had my issues. I had a stress fracture in my foot when I was playing in college. And then as you and I have talked about before, I had that Achilles issue last fall, which was easily the toughest thing I've ever had to deal with uh, in terms of like injury rehab type of stuff. But for the most part, I've been very lucky. So my knees have felt strong. So I can't really speak to that specifically. That said, like, I, I thought he was I thought he looked really good for the most part in that mm. game, with exception of the actual injury itself. And even when he came back, I thought like when well, he came back in in that third quarter and they just immediately started dominating again. I think his physical advantages, especially in this particular series, are enough to get it done. Mm. I uh, was I was looking into the numbers. The Sixers outscored the Knicks in the half court in that game by mm. 22 points per 100 possessions. Crazy. The, the Where they lost the game was on the offensive glass. Like a, that was basically the game. And so Sixers do have a chance in this series over time. I wonder if he could get stronger. And I guess that's my question for you is like, is this one of those things where he's kind of teetering? He kind of gets over the hump and gain conditioning and gains strength. He'll progress over time. Or do you just foresee this? worse and worse until they eventually get eliminated, finally can rest. Yeah, I think that he's putting a lot of risk when it comes to having his knee become further damaged. Um, Because if it buckles twice in this amount of time, it's inevitable that it'll happen again. And I didn't even think he was going to return to that game. And I just feel like it's a recipe for disaster him playing right now. Yeah, and the scary part specifically with him is like at this point, I'm not even sure if he could afford a year long type of injury. Right. Because I think we can all agree Beats Prime is probably a tough window than the majority of players that come into the league and have his kind of victory. Um, he's just done a lot. He's a big dude in general. Uh, he's had, first came into the league was a foot issues that he was having when he first came in with Philly. So like he's just had a bunch of issues down there. And so I, I see it as kind of being a short little window of contention to begin with. The one thing though, is like, I kind of think the East is there for the taking. Mm. And I wonder if they see an opportunity because if I'm Philly, again, I understand the Knicks are and the team 
home team wins game one. They win the series the vast majority of the time. So they're obviously in commanding position. But if I'm Philly, I'm like, we're the better half court team. We could beat these guys. If we win this series, it's the Indiana Pacers or the Milwaukee Bucks with a Giannis coming back from an injury in the next round. We could beat those guys. Now we're in the conference finals. Anything can happen. And then if I'm uh, the other thing with Philly is like they have held up really well against Denver. Yeah. So if you happen to get past Boston, you like your chances. And so I wonder how much of this with Embiid in the calculus is like he sees an opportunity to try a trophy here. Yeah. I think maybe they just feel like this is always going to be how it is with Embiid. So let's just go for it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. that That's the other part too, is like, it's almost when, when you look back, it's like last year, it was the knee. Um, two years ago, it was the, uh, what was it? OG Ananobi hit him in the face with his elbow or something. And he had like that orbital fracture. Now, right. mind you, that one's not as, uh, you know, not as, you know, lower body related, but he has more or less played injured the majority of his playoff career. So at a certain point, I mean, you're right. Like if it, like everyone's a little banged up to, f- to be clear, like there's nobody out there right now. That's like, man, I feel like it's day one of training camp. Like that, that, that that's not how this right. works, but right. it definitely feels like he's been dealing with this kind of thing in general. And it, it's kind of just part of what he has to cope with. What have you made of Josh Hart's play? My question to you is, can he really shoot? Because the energy transfer doesn't look good when I watch him shoot, but then he just makes shots when it matters. Yeah, he's got like this really long, drawn out release. Uh, You know, in my series preview, I talked a lot about how I thought the Sixers would close out short to him. I mean, it's just it's kind of what you have to do. I mean, again, like people, I I feel like fans sometimes have this expectation that you're supposed to cover all your bases. But the truth of the matter is when you're dealing with elite teams and great players like Jalen Brunson, you give yourself your best chance to guard them when you make concessions elsewhere. And I want to say Josh Hart was shooting about 32.5% on catch-and-shoot jump shots in the regular season and in field goal percentage. So, like, it was an obvious kind of strategic approach for the Sixers to be like, let's dig down off of Josh Hart. And yeah, he just... Now, to Josh Hart's credit, because I think a lot of people make it all about shooting. It's not just about shooting. Like, he's a wrecking ball in the offensive glass, too. Yeah. And that's a big, like, there's so many different ways to provide spacing off the ball, and Josh Hart does a lot of that. But, like, man, those had to have felt like gut punches for Philly to watch him sink in those threes. And dude, how about that Madison Square Garden crowd? Like, they, yeah. they the roof blew off of the, that place when those shots went down. Yeah, I was I was actually at a Knicks fan TV party. Shouts to Knicks fan TV. Shouts to the NBA report. The Knicks fans are different, man. They're yeah. different when their team is winning. They've been wait. I, they went through some tough years, and they're happy to be here right now. Yeah, I want to. I want to shout out one other guy on the Knicks um, because that half court dynamic that I talked about—that twenty-two point per one hundred possession advantage for Philly—a big part of that was in the first three quarters in particular. The Sixers in the half court just would run Maxi and be two man game, or right. or like some sort of brush screen for Tyrese Maxey where he would just kind of, you know, reject the screen or something and get downhill. And man, Tyrese was amazing in that third quarter run, just beating people off the dribble and getting into the lane. But I thought that, um, I thought Mitchell Robinson showed that he can kind of like credibly guard Embiid. And I, I kind of talked about this on my show the other night, but what specifically stood out to me is, uh, uh I went on this, this rant in my show. Like, obviously I, I play a lot with the ball in my hands now. And when I, the the vast majority of the players I go against, because I'm 6'6 six, six and I have long arms, they can't contest my, my pull-up jump shot. They just can't. Like, I, I'm going to, I can just hit a basic in and out dribble or, or step back or something. I'm going to get a shot off. But when I do run into a player that has like, like, a, like a six, seven wing with super long arms. And uh, there's a specific guy here in town. His name's Kalen Tippin. Uh, Kalen Tippin, shout out Kalen. Um, that him and I match up together. And he's like the one guy that can actually like use his length to bother me a little bit. It makes it so that I have to get separation. And then it's a totally different game at that point. Right. And so then I start running him through screens and trying to to, to get sh- sh- uh, sh- shook free from him as best I can. And like with Embiid, you actually see that dynamic with the vast majority of players in the league where it's like you either they they either have to give him too much space and then he can just comfortably and easily rise up into that 15 footer. And he's been making it at over 50% all season long. Right. Or they press up on him 
And then they start getting called for fouls because they're in his shooting pocket and he's good at kind of manipulating that that kind of battle there in the triple threat, right? Well, Mitchell kind of has the ability to give him space while also getting a really good contest yeah. on that pull-up jump shot. Do you notice those last few Embiid miss jumpers were way short? Like yeah. way short. Now, obviously the knee, I think, plays some role in that, but I thought a big part of it was Mitchell kind of provides a unique physical build to bother him. And it kind of reminds me of like all the, like when you're a true bona fide superstar, like a top tier guy, like Embiid is like, you're obviously going to just rip right through the vast majority of players in the league, but there's always like one or two guys that kind of sort of match up with you physically and make things hard. Even for Jokic and beads, one of those guys and bead can kind of hang with yeah. Jokic with size. Nurkic can kind of hang with Jokic. Think prime LeBron, it's Kawhi Leonard, it's Andre Guadala. When he would run into these guys that could really match up physically, it would make a new challenge for that star to kind of overcome. And I'm really interested to see the Mitchell Robinson and Bede match up the rest of this series because I think Embiid's going to have to solve that puzzle. Now, he did get a rip-through foul on him late in the game where he kind of like he stopped settling for jump shots and he ripped through and he got... So I wonder if that's what he'll go to in game two is just more physical aggression against... Mitchell Robinson, but that to your point is going to be more fatiguing on the knee as well. Yeah. And I hate to go keep going back to the knee, but picture your situation, right? With your friend guarding you, but any step you take your knee could buckle and that'll yeah. be it. That'll be in the back of your mind as well. So it's Mitch doing a great job of you and that in the back of your mind as well. You're not only playing against Mitch and the Knicks, you're playing against your own body. Yeah. A hundred percent. And like, but like, I will say like that, it's interesting because I I saw I saw Deuce McBride as being a guy that could potentially play a much bigger role in this series because his mm. speed matches up with uh yeah. because the speed matches up so well with Maxi. But Isaiah Hartenstein had been playing so well offensively for the Knicks that I just never even really thought much about Mitchell Robinson as a significant factor in this series. And like after game one, I was like, man, I gotta like completely readjust my calculus here. But dude, I don't know if you remember, I I tweeted out a, a video a while back. It was in the uh, a Knicks game against the um, against the Bucks, a transition defense possession where he sprinted back and got around to the other side of a screen and blocked Damian Lillard on a pull up three yeah, in that. transition. And like and Mitchell Mitchell Robinson is is he's legitimately one of the most gifted athletes that we have in the league. And I think I think he's become a little bit underrated as a defensive player. Yeah, when you're a big that doesn't space it on the offensive side, I think people don't look at you the same anymore because the way the modern NBA is, but he's still so valuable. Oh, absolutely. And, and again, like those, those supreme physical advantages, like what Embiid has, they can really warp a series. I mean, look at Jokic. Like that's the big thing with Jokic is like every single series, Denver has this simple advantage, which is like, no one's big and strong enough to disrupt Jokic. So they're just consistently operating comfortably on offense and and that's the thing is like to be able to get a guy that can go toe to toe for that and for for example for phoenix i underrated that when they went after nurkic like it's not just that he's got a guy that can operate in the yeah. short role or run their five out offense and scream screen really well he's nearly as big as Jokic and can kind of bang with him a little bit like having that kind of athlete for matchups I think is super valuable Aaron Gordon to match up with all the forwards for instance well, for Denver most definitely you mentioned Jokic so we could segue to your Los Angeles Lakers AD <laughs> plays great LeBron plays well they still lose is this a good or bad sign for your Lakers so here's the thing it, it qualified by saying Denver's better like Denver's better they're supposed to win they're going to win in all likelihood they're favored all that stuff right but now let's shift over to the Lakers and and look at it from their perspective um you you your stars for the most part played great I thought LeBron had LeBron not been so bad in those two bad runs because LeBron was really good the majority of the night but he was super uh, sloppy during the two runs. There was a 10-0 run in the second quarter in less than two minutes in a 13-0 run in the third quarter in about three and a half minutes. And in both of those runs, LeBron was super sloppy, especially as just an offensive initiator. And outside of that, I thought LeBron and AD were really good. Is, so that, like, is that fatigue, Jason? Absolutely. So yeah. my, my, my read on what happened in that game was it was pretty clear at the opening tip that D'Lo and Austin just just weren't in it that night. They just yeah, had really yeah. bad nights. 
And so when when the Lakers are really good, LeBron can pick his spots as an offensive player because D'Lo and Austin have it going. But when when it was clear that D'Lo and Austin didn't have it going, LeBron kind of had to do everything on offense. And if you remember in that first quarter and a half, he was getting downhill and getting to the rim like crazy against the Nuggets. And so he had it all going. And then when he got tired, what LeBron does when he has when he gets tired, he kind of plays upright. And he's not like down and downhill and aggressive. He kind of plays upright and he just kind of starts trying to manipulate the defense with the pass. And what he'll do is like, oh, passes before the, like he'll throw pass before actually getting downhill and creating an opening for the pocket. He'll throw the swing pass before he gets downhill, gets the, the defense towards him more. And so, yeah, when I looked at the film, and I did a film session for people who want to see it. It's on my YouTube channel. But uh, uh, I thought that I thought that LeBron got fatigued. And so really the Lakers path is if they get a better Austin and D'Lo game, if they, because those guys, Austin, D'Lo and, and Rui got soundly outplayed by MPJ, uh, Aaron Gordon and KCP. If they can kind of bring that back up and LeBron and AD play the way that they did, the Lakers have a good chance to win. And I think they will do that once or twice in the series. I just... Can you imagine a scenario where four times in the next six games that starting five is able to outplay Denver starting five? It just seems really unlikely to me. Yeah, I think if we do get a D'Lo or Austin game, it'll be close. And then when it comes to the end of the game, Denver has Jokic and Murray playing two-man game. And especially Jokic, he just picks teams apart. It feels like he gets better when the game is close. He does. And, and like specifically just, they have a really, really simple order of operations at the end of games. Like they don't, they don't have any sort of question mark about what they're going to do. Uh-huh. And w- one of the thing, one of the things I'll say with the Lakers is like, they were an outstanding clutch team this year against everybody, but Denver. I want to say they were, I want to say they, they had the best clutch record in the league, I think at 24 and nine, but they were zero and two in clutch games against Denver. So they're 24 and seven against everyone else. And uh, they have their own kind of little pet action that they run at the end of games. It's the Austin LeBron two man game. And one of the main reasons why it didn't function at the end of their last game back in March when Denver won was Darwin closed with Cam Reddish. And so they just, it was like, it didn't matter that they were running this action because Denver was just loading up in the paint. And so I think that, I think that, yeah, over the course of the series, those clutch situations will favor Denver. But I, I again, I do think the Lakers will get one or one, one or two of these. So you don't really see a scenario where the Lakers could win this series. I'm not going to say that they can't. It's just, it's just to put it simply, like just, just get down into the individual matchups for a second. Like who's more likely to outplay who over the rest of the series, Rui or Aaron Gordon? Aaron, I mean, I think Aaron, Aaron Gordon, Gordon will will play, yeah. will outplay him. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah. now what about what about let's say uh, Michael Porter Jr. versus Austin Reeves? Like that's maybe more even, right? A little bit more yeah. even. Yeah. Uh, what, what about yeah. what about D'Lo KCP? Well, D'Lo's ceiling is higher, but KCP is more steady. Yeah, exactly. Like that that's the thing is like I would argue in terms of value, like D'Lo's value to the Lakers really shines through when he hits like five, six threes in a game. And he'll do that once or twice in the series. But every single game of this series, KCP is going to provide excellent perimeter defense, excellent offensive yeah. mobility, screening, run in a transition, hitting threes, all that kind of stuff. So like and then looking at the the LeBron AD matchup. I do think LeBron will outplay Jamal Murray over the course of the series, which is a dynamic they didn't have last year. J- Jamal soundly outplayed LeBron. And AD did. I, I One of the big s- stories of last year's series is AD could not score on Jokic one-on-one. And and he got he gave him some buckets last in that game on Saturday night. He probably scored on him one-on-one probably four or five times. Right. So, like, I think the LeBron AD dynamic will, will close the gap with Murray Jokic in this series more than they did last year by a significant amount. But it's it's mainly that other group of three guys that that they just can't really get anything out of. And I even you could even make the case that Peyton Watson and Christian Brown are going to be more impactful over the course of the series than a Spencer Dinwiddie or a Gabe Vincent. Although I actually liked Gabe's minutes, I thought he was a little bit of a defensive wrecking ball in that game. Yeah. Um, you just, it's just the thing with Gabe and Spencer is they're just super limited offensively right now. Yeah. You mentioned Gabe and that would be an interesting sub for D'Lo. The only thing with D'Lo is, is that 
you kind of got to live with the mistakes and the turnovers for that chance for him to break out. Yeah, it's just there's got to be a fine line. Like, I 100% agree with you. There's a, th there's a bunch of different things that turned around the Lakers offense starting in January. Because, like, from January 7th through the end of the year, it was a 46-game sample. They were the third best defense in the league. It's It's been a, more than half the season. They've been an elite offense. And it's come down to several things. First of all, they kept stuck with their five-out offense, and they started to figure it out. And so there's a continuity element to it. It took a little while because they ran a different offense last year. So it was an adjustment period, right? Uh, Austin Reeves started the year really rough over the course of the year, started to kind of figure out what his role was in the offense. Rui Hachimura beginning of the year was like an on an Island scorer who was really struggling. Remember those baseline cuts that he was having against the Pelicans. That was something that just started to come around the second half of the year. He started to figure out his role in the five out offense. LeBron right. obviously playing super well, but easily the biggest element to the Laker offense taking off was D'Lo. D'Lo was basically a 20 point per game guy. He was a high right. volume high volume, 45% three point shooter for the last half of the season. Like that's what it was, but it does come with highs and lows. And so I'm a big believer that you have to give him another chance and lean into it uh, in game two, but there's gotta be a moment where you pull the plug. And so like, let's say for instance, he goes into game two and it's a stinker and they go down Oh two. And then you go back to LA and like at the end of the first quarter, Delo's 0 for 4 with two turnovers and has made a bunch of defensive mistakes. You got to pull the plug and you got to lean into Gabe or Spencer. Like I just, I, I'm with you in the sense that you've got to give Delo his chance to get it going, but you can't go down like you did last year where you wait until like where you wait until it's too late to get off of the Delo problem. Let's stay in LA, but shift to the Clippers. No Kawhi, no problem. Playoff James was in full effect. The Mavs disappointing. What what adjustments do you think they can make? So the story of that game, in my opinion, was, you know, it's funny because Ty Lue, I think, is a very different type of coach than the Steve Kerr, Eric Spolstra type of a group. Like Steve Kerr and Eric Spolstra are like super schematically creative. I view Ty Lue as like one of the best brute force coaches in the league. And what I mean by that is like he just understands the baseline concept of matchup attacking. And and he leans heavily into it. As a Laker fan, I can say this because every single time he plays the Lakers, it's like from the opening tip, it's like, where's Austin? We're going after Austin. And Austin's actually a decent defender. It's just that he can't guard Paul George or Kawhi Leonard super well, right? You know? And uh, and so it's one of those things where um, you could tell from the opening tip, it was like, okay, uh, let's throw the ball to Zubac against Gafford and see if he can guard him. And it was like, post, 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 foul. Post, 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 easy bucket. Post, 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 easy bucket. Okay, we got to get Gafford out of there. Gafford's out of the game literally three and a half minutes in. He was eight and a half minutes left in the first quarter. He was gone, right? And then right after that, Gafford's out. They immediately start going after Luka. And, and it was like literally James Harden brings the ball to the floor. Amir Coffey comes up and sets a screen, gets Luka switched on to James Harden. James Harden goes to work. And he immediately drove by him, kicked to Russell Westbrook wide open three, knocked it down. Immediately drove into him, got a step back three. Immediately drove uh, at him again. Luka was way far back, like five feet off of him. Hits another pull-up three. The rest of that game, it was like, find Luka, get him switched onto whoever the on-ball guy is. Even if it was like Norman Powell, or like, like anybody who could get Luka on a switch was going after him. And they were just attacking him every single time down the floor. I mean, do you remember? Do you remember Paul George's missed dunk? Yep. Uh, or not missed dunk, where we got blocked by Gafford. Like yep. literally, all that was is ball screen. Get Luca switched onto Paul George. Simple crossover dribble. Toast Luca off the dribble. Yeah, he went up and got blocked, but both rim protectors came over. So Zubac was just waiting underneath the rim to put that back in. So the thing that's stupid about that is like there's such an easy schematic fix there, and it's just to hedge and recover. And all you have to do is find a guy who can't hit movement threes and it'll work. And the Clippers always are playing one of Terrence Mann and Russell Westbrook. So the easy solution here is instead of having Luca switch those guard guard screens, just have him hedge and recover. And as long as he does his job, which is just step out, cut off the driving lane, uh, close out short to the guy who's the shooter, that should in theory mitigate that specific issue. The offensive end is where the main my major concern is, and I'm not sure there's a good answer. Ty Lue is also the uh, the matchup attacker on the defensive end, meaning like he's very much like a leave a guy open and dare him if he doesn't trust him. And you could just tell they were openly doubling ISOs for Kyrie and Luka. They were guarding pick and roll three on two. They were doing all that stuff because on the weak side, there were these two-on-ones that would keep developing where it'd be like James Harden on the weak side, 
against like PJ Washington and Derek Jones Jr. And what what James Harden would do is just close out to the passing lane and basically bait those guys into their own indecisiveness and lack of confidence on the offensive end of the floor. And by the way, the whole tail end of the season, that was the book on Dallas was like, it, it, to put it simply, this is actually a crazy stat. Every year of the Luka Doncic experience in Dallas, it's been more efficient defensively to make him a score than a passer. So if you blitzed Luka and pick and roll to get rid of the basketball or or just in general loaded up on him, it was the, the Mavericks were more efficient when Luka was passing. This year is the first year that dynamic has flipped. It's actually more efficient to get the ball out of Luka's hands because the weak side guys aren't as good offensively. And that, that's kind of the trade-off, right? Like you can go the Phoenix route where you have all these really good offensive players off ball and the driving kick is awesome, but you're not as good defensively or physically. Or you can go the Mavericks route where it's like you got PJ Washington and Maxi Kleba and these really good athletes that can defend and rebound on the back line, but they're kind of limited offensively. And so there's some sort of drawback there. And I think that that's, that's not a problem that's going away. The Clippers all series long are going to ignore Kleba and PJ Washington and Derek Jones Jr. and try to make those guys make shots. And they're just going to have to do so. Or Kyrie and Luca are going to have to hit their over the top shots, which they just didn't in this particular game. And uh, like <clears throat> they're in some trouble here. This is not going to be an easy series, even, even if Kawhi doesn't play. So you just feel like they lack the amount of players to read and react, kind of like how we see in the Warriors win championships, even the Nuggets, they had Bruce Brown on that four on three to make a play. You feel like there's not enough of that to even win this series? Yeah, you know, honestly, I was talking about this with Colin last night, and I'm actually really curious to hear your opinion. Um, is the era of the couple of stars and specialists over? Because, like, when I really look at it, it's the – you look at the uh, – um, like the 2018 Cavs after they traded Kyrie yeah. Irving. I mean, LeBron is, like, just, Le LeBron is just so great that it, it could work that way. But And then I think that was the archetype. We saw it with like Luka, Giannis a little bit. But yeah, yeah. I, I'm with you. And, yeah. and, and, and the Harden, Chris Paul, Rockets were, were like that too, where it's like you get two primary ball handlers and then everyone else is a specialist and you play off of that. And to your point, it worked with LeBron because he's LeBron, but – the Harden, Chris Paul Rockets, there was always a limitation. The This uh, Mavericks team, there seems to be a little bit of a limitation. That was the case in 2022 as well. And then also just look back at the last couple of champions. It's like uh, 2023 Denver, that is very much a read and react. Everyone is a every, – like every player in that lineup is super versatile. You go to that Golden State Warriors team in 2022, every single player in that lineup is super versatile. Even going to that Bucks team – it's like between Drew Holiday and uh, Chris Middleton and Giannis and Brooke Lopez, like every one of those guys has more to their game than just being a specialist. And so I think there's something to be said about like the, the basketball becomes so adaptive when you get into the postseason because really everything goes wrong. Everything goes wrong. A lot of the stuff you start to use in the started to use in the regular season fails. Some guys that used to be able to hit shots stop hitting shots. Some things in your defensive scheme that you used to do suddenly don't work in a specific matchup. And it's so it becomes so much about adaptability. And like the when you have really versatile basketball players, they're just more capable of that form of adaptability. Yeah, I think that's the influence of the international game because I remember, you know, playing overseas, the bigs could shoot and pass a little bit, right? the guards could post a little bit and everybody can make a play. I, and I think we're seeing more international players in the NBA now, and it's started to become more read and react type offense. And I honestly, I honestly believe that's the best way to play basketball. hundred percent agree. And, and the other thing too, is like just in the NBA level in particular, since the power forward position has effectively just become another wing, mind you a bigger wing, but another wing. And then also there's just not very many uh, – there's not very many slow plotting centers. Like most of our centers that we have in the league right now are relatively athletic, right? Like even you watch that Pelicans Thunder game last night, it's like the the Pelicans go down with Nance at center. It's Nance and Chet. It's these two like freak athletes at the center position, right? Like there's a lot of athleticism on the floor in general. And so what happens in that case is there's so much rotational speed. And what I mean by that is like you can throw two guys on the ball and rotate out of it relatively well around the league. And so those four on threes aren't simple, easy basketball. They're usually like pretty complex, uh, you know, read and react plays. And so, yeah, the, the, the 
kind of aggregate offensive skill and IQ of those four players is yeah. incredibly important because if that guy on the short roll hesitates for a second, there's these defenses are so fast. Now the rotation is made. The advantage is gone, right? Like a guy, if a guy is a little hesitant as a catch and shoot player. So like, like if you can throw a late closeout and he won't shoot it because he's hesitant. Okay. Now your advantage is gone. If a guy is a good shooter, but he can't attack closeouts and you chase him off the line, then the advantage is gone. Right. So like you just have to have down the roster skill and IQ in a way that wasn't for the record. It's a big part of why I like this Lakers team is they all five guys in that starting yeah. lineup are really high level offensive players. And, and, and it's part of why they were one of the very best teams in the league over the last, you know, uh, half of the season. Yeah. How good your weaknesses are, are really important because in the NBA, you can't take away everything. And if you're giving mm. something up, you want to be able to make that defense pay. Let's shift uh, to the last series. We'll talk about today. The Suns, like, I feel like, you know, we always talk about gravity and I feel like they don't, do they have a rim running big, like besides all their shooting? So they don't, um, but it, and, it's and is tricky. That, is that, is that a new huge issue for them? I don't think it is. I, I think the Nurkic, I, Nurkic is the Nurkic uh, kind of situation works fine. Eubanks is a little bit of an issue, but like, I, I always get, I always get annoyed when people overly focus on backup center because I swear every team has a bad backup center. <laughs> like I, I don't, except, except like, the Knicks, except the Knicks, except for the Knicks. Yeah, exactly. The Knicks are very lucky to have two starting caliber starting centers, but yeah. for the most part, like, and also e even just from the standpoint of team building, it's stupid to waste money and resources on a backup big, like at least to that extent. Right. But uh, looking at Nurkic, the, I, I actually blame the stars in this case. So, to me, the big story of this series with the Suns having the ball is the Suns playing advantage basketball versus playing shot-making basketball. And so what I mean by that is last year in the postseason, they had an assist percentage of 50, uh, 57%. That means 57% of their made field goals were assisted. And that was a problem last year. It was a lot of one-on-one. -on -one. It was a lot of two-on-two -two in ball screens, a lot of pull-up jump shots for Devin Booker and Kevin Durant, right? And when they went in, they would win. And when they would miss, they would lose. That was more or less the dynamic for the Suns last year. This year, they've been a very high assist percentage team. As a matter of fact, post uh, All-Star break, they had a 66% assist percentage. In that Timberwolves game, they had assists on fewer than half of their, field, their made field goals. So one of the things, now, some of that's game plan. What Minnesota is doing is they're trying to stay home off the ball and force those guys to play one-on-one -on -one and two-on-two -two and make really tough contested jump shots. But... I think the Suns have to try to not fall into that trap. And this is the easy fix, in my opinion. So Kevin Durant drew the Ke Carl Towns matchup, which I thought was really interesting because in the regular season matchup on Sunday before uh, a week ago yesterday, in the regular season matchup, they actually put Ant on KD and then they uh, and they put uh, Jaden McDaniels on Booker and Beal got Mike Conley, okay? What they did this time to mix it up is they put Ant on Beal. That time and they, they did that? Uh, no to in in the game on Saturday. Okay. So, so again in the regular season finale, it was Ant was guarding KD. In game one, Carl Towns was guarding KD, and so KD was the guy who went off. Right? Beal right. and Booker really struggled. KD had thirty one on eleven for seventeen or whatever. Right? And what I thought was interesting there is like. I think KD needs to use that matchup, the the Carl Towns matchup, to draw double teams. Meaning, gotcha. like, he needs to look to beat him off the dribble and get the defense in rotation. Because I think if the Suns can get Bradley Beal and Devin Booker closeout opportunities, then they'll start that drive and kick attack, and they'll start to get more assists, and they'll look really good offensively. I'm a big believer that the three-star build requires everyone to be kind of playing for each other in an equal opportunity system. If it goes to your turn, my turn, I think you get diminishing returns on the three-star build. And so like, it's really important to me to not get into that. Your turn, my turn, Devin Booker is going to try to score on Jaden. Now Bradley Beal is going to try to score on ant. Now, no, no, yeah. no. You got to get the defense in rotation. You got to play drive and kick. It's been a, it's been a consistent theme for the Suns this year. When they get the defense in rotation, they look great. When they play on an island, they they don't play very well. Those three are such smart basketball players, so I'm sure they realize that as well. But a lot of their game is just predicated on ISO scoring. And I feel like 
they have a passion. They have a love for doing that, especially when it comes to Booker and KD. Yeah, it's like I was actually saying this on my show the other day. It's like it's almost like they take it personal. It's like, oh, like I have to show that I can score on Jaden. And it's like, no, you don't. <laughs> it's like you don't get any bonus points for scoring on Jaden versus scoring on anybody else. And like, again, like I, 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 I this is the example that I use. So king of the court. Mm. If we if we put pros like a bunch of a bunch of uh, guys like us who played in the college level, played overseas, whatever it is, and we played king of the court. Gap between a out and an ISO going to be smaller because we have a lot of higher level offensive polish as scores, right? But you go to the high school level and like the chasm, it's actually hilarious. Like at the high school level, if I have the kids play king of the court against a set defender and then I move it towards a closeout, mm-hmm. the, they will score against a closeout like five times as frequently as they will against a set defender because the on ball uh, uh, skill is just not as good right at that level, but still at the NBA level, that gap is smaller, but it's still a gap like Devin Booker going against Jaden McDaniels in a two on two or a one on one situation against a set loaded up defense is going to be a substantially lower percentage play than if Jaden McDaniels is closing out at him. And right. so they just have to find they just have to find ways to generate those opportunities more. And to me, the easy answer again is like use cat as an entry point, not as a not as like a uh, a, an opportunity to score on an island. And then again, if Mike Conley is going to be on Grayson Allen, every single action needs to like I would literally just run cat Grayson two man game. Or excuse me. KD Grayson two man game and put Minnesota's two worst defenders in the action, get them to make some sort of mistake that requires a helper to move over and then, and then get into rotation. They're just, again, that that's the pendulum for Phoenix is they cannot play into Minnesota's trap. Minnesota's trap is their perimeter defenders are better than most of the perimeter defenders in the league. And Rudy Gobert is obviously bracketing that on the backside. You cannot play on an Island against them. If you do, you're going to lose. Jason, great stuff. You know you're always welcome back on the show. Where can we find you? Social media and everywhere else so they can catch the lifelong instant reaction of this time of the year. It's just, <laughs> it's just, it's just, con- it's just constant instant reactions over and over again. We love it. You guys can follow me on Twitter at underscore Jason LT. Our YouTube channel and podcast feed are both under hoops tonight. Uh, like I said, we go live on YouTube the vast majority of nights during the NBA playoffs. And then I wake up in the morning and I do film sessions and I'll be doing one today. So, uh, Uh, Make sure you guys check out those feeds. And yeah, man, let's uh, let's uh, let's make sure we get back together a few more times in this playoff run. Most definitely. We'll make it happen, Jason, and talk soon.